panel today. Um, I'm going to ask them to get as specific as possible and kind of talk uh, specifically about niches or projects that you've worked on. So the more specific, the better. I think that we're all here because we understand inherently how powerful this medium is. So let's assume that and how are we like kind of getting in there and getting it done. So we'll talk about the creative process. We're going to talk about distribution, what you guys are thinking, what you guys are seeing, um, kind of advice and sort of action to people. Um, and we'll be talking about success metrics as well and how do you measure a good campaign and how do you kind of look at those types of numbers. Um, so I'm going to have everyone go down the row and introduce yourself. My name is Malia Probst. I am brand director at VR Scout. And uh, yeah, Clay? I'm Clay Weizar. I'm a creative director at Tool of North America. We do experiential VR and live action. I'm Vince Kakache. I'm the founder and CEO of Vertebrae. We are a virtual reality advertising platform based in Santa Monica. Hi, Christine Lee with Immersive, I'm also a advertising platform for virtual reality based in San Francisco and LA. Jennifer Ritchie, I'm uh, one of the original founders of Gravity Jack, and I'm actually in Washington State, so I get the award for traveling the farthest. Uh, we do custom solutions uh, for augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile apps, 360, all of the above. Hey guys, I'm Donnie Mackauer. I'm the president of Red Interactive Agency. We're a customer experience agency with deep roots in digital, and we work across the entire ecosystem of a brand. Cool, thanks guys. Um, so let's talk about, first, I wanna get into the case studies in a moment, but let's first kind of talk about development and education, right? So how are you guys perhaps getting your teams internally up to speed? So how are you perhaps building out your in-house VR, AR, 360 strategy? Um, if you are one of the companies that provides that solution, how are you educating your clients? So uh, Clay, if you wanna kick it off. Yeah, I think for us, having a really good creative technologist, um, introduced us to VR early, um, and then from there we started building stuff. Remember, he got the Oculus DK1 and he's like, okay, let's make something. Everybody loves South Park in our office, so we created South Park VR um, just based on a passion project, and from there it, it spiraled. Nice, South Park VR, I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're more of a technology platform, but we do, you know, before we, um, before we race around and even still we'll do some services projects uh, mostly on the interactive side and try and keep up to date with you know some of the most cutting-edge production techniques like we've been doing some stuff with uh, making ad units where you do kind of stop-motion animation uh, with 3d printed characters and you can get a higher level of fidelity in mobile VR with a lower time to production so we've been messing around with some of that stuff but try and stay up to date um, on the space. And then from 360 video perspective, we generally work with uh, production partners. Awesome, Christine. So also kind of a similar angle in that we are a tech company versus a content uh, producer. So um, I would say in terms of how we educate ourselves, there's kind of two main things. Um, first is actually looking at historical, right? Looking at what happened on digital, what happened on mobile. How can we apply what we've learned there, whether it's mistakes, whether it's successes, to VR, right? And in the case of advertising, there's a lot of things that we've learned, which is, you know, don't throw an ad in someone's face or make sure you could get out of the ad once you're showing it to them. Make sure that there's a flow that works from end to end. So I would say educating from the past is one thing. And then now is educating from what we're actually seeing on the network, which is super interesting. So we're live and we're able to see with all the different publishers that have integrated us really interesting data from you know what platforms are users on how are they engaging with the content uh, to you know what day of the week are they on you know is it weekends heavy is it night heavy um, we're also seeing you know where is the actual traffic like are people in Asia are people in Europe and we're able to see all those numbers and actually learn and adjust the products based on that Jennifer We've got a, a bit of a different angle than you know a lot of the people on the panel in that we, again, do the custom solutions and custom um, angles that are a variety, a wide variety. So we can go from what has worked in the past, or at least what has been used in the past, what's been talked about in the past. The team is very much on, you know, again, we do a variety, so we stay up to speed on the different platforms, the different devices that, you know, that we're recommending ultimately to our clients. So it's really staying, staying on top of what's current and what's coming. Because if we're doing a mobile app experience, or uh, um, you know, even if it's Headset Vive for any of the above, 
there's a cycle in the development. So we want to make sure we're looking forward to what's, what's coming, what's going to be released here in the next one, two, three months. And if it's a six month project, we can say, this is what's coming. Let's integrate it into your strategy now. So how do you sort of uh, focus on your clients and how do you, how do you get them up to speed? Like how do you do that education process with the client on the client side, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely an art. Because they're, you're teaching them, first, you're, some of them, you're telling them a hole that they have that they didn't know was present. And then you're saying, I have a solution for this hole that you didn't even know existed. So it's definitely a, a very creative way. But some of our best uh, work is, tell us your problems. Our clients, if our clients come to us with the problems, then we can internally creatively strategize on how we can solve their problems from a technology standpoint, be it VR, AR, or subtle ways that we can connect all of them in a, in a mixed reality type scenario. Okay. Um, Donnie, what about you? How about education and development sort of internally and then uh, perhaps on the client side as well? Right. So we're an agency that works with a lot of big brands, many of which are global. And so we have eight different business units within the agency, one of which is called RedX, our internal innovations team. And we focus around customer experience innovations, which often centers around AR and VR opportunities. And so they, quite a long time ago, did a deep dive into the space. We also spun up our research and insights team, which sits inside our experience design team. And together, they put together a large scale presentation. We have all the gear in our office. I mean, everything, it's like a big playground. Sometimes we have kids of red come over and have fun. And we've, we've experimented with all the gear. We've looked at the landscape. We understand what it takes to create different types of content. So we created a big internal presentation and this Red X team essentially went around to all of our different groups and did little TED Talks for all of our different business units internally to bring everyone up to speed. And we are often doing some version of that for our clients because almost to a point you were making, it, this reminds me of like when the app store first came around and then you had every brand going, we need an app. It didn't even start with a goal. It was just like, we need an app, what should it be? And then it's like, knowing you want an app, you're trying to back into a solution. There's something similar happening now where it's like, we know we need to do something with VR. But it's like, that's not really the right approach. So, you know, what are your goals? What are you trying to create? What kind of customer experience? And then we should look to VR or AR or whatever and see if that should be part of the customer experience journey. So there is some education that needs to happen there still. Yeah, yeah, that fundamental question of why VR first and foremost, right? Yeah. Um, Clay, I want to go to you and let's talk about uh, case studies and focuses and the sort of, sort of specific niches that you guys focus on. And from the ad platform, guys, I would love to kind of hear how you make um, branded units in these experiences that aren't intrusive. You know what I mean? How do you make sure it's something that people don't want to opt out of? How do you make sure it's something that's kind of like intuitive? So if you could kind of like maybe build that into this case study, that would be awesome. Um, Clay from, from Tool. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited about this one. We just finished it. Um, it's a project for Adidas called uh, Project Harden. And Adidas came to us. Um, they had a massive event. They wanted to launch a shoe but they didn't want any product leaks because it's a huge, huge thing for them, um, a big concern. And one thing that uh, a VR kind of experiential event does, it allows people to see the actual product, um, but they can't take it with them. All they, ha they have it in their memory. Um, so we did a project where we uh, went to a giant basketball camp in Las Vegas and we created um, a haptic kind of experiential VR experience. We had four pillars. Um, people would step up onto it, put on a Samsung gear. Um, we synced live action with fans and haptic vibrations under their feet and tied that into a narrative. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was fascinating. But the big takeaway, I think, from it, and you know, when you say niche, um, I had never heard, of, heard this before the event, but it really solves that client problem of product leaks, and I think that that was a real learning experience for us. Awesome. Thank you. So from our perspective, uh, we have a campaign live right now with Lionsgate for the new Blair Witch movie, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's this really cool like interactive horror VR ad experience where you're you know, right next to the Blair Witch house in the woods, and there's kind of all this terrifying stuff that's happening around you, and the ad actually lives as a pre-roll, um, and in this case, it's a uh, gaze-based interactive on-rails experience, uh, meaning that you know, from an ad perspective, uh, within 
uh, virtual ad experience. You don't want to have to teach a user uh, navigation or controls per se, but you want it to feel interactive. And so some of the ways that we do that are with gaze-based interaction where, you know, because I'm looking this way, I can make a bunch of terrifying stuff happen behind me. And then whenever the user turns around and sees it and it wasn't there before, they think something's behind them. And then there's scare moments that are triggered by specific turns. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we try and leave it up to the publisher uh, from the perspective of do they want to do something that's native within their content um, or that lives as a pre-roll or alongside their content. And some content is conducive to advertising, right? And other times it's not. And if it'll mess up the narrative of the content, you know, in this case, Lionsgate approached us and they said we want a contextually relevant um, ad experience geared towards a horror audience that can fulfill you know, a certain single digit million X number of impressions. And so, you know, it was kind of more of a, a matchmaking at that point. And I mean, that's kind of where we are as an industry from an advertising platform perspective, right? There's not, you know, 20 advertisers bidding for the same spot on a piece of content. It's, you know, a Chinese menu list on the demand and the supply side and kind of some hand holding in the process. And so, um, you know, through that experience, we have kind of some interesting data to share from it as well that I guess we'll get to in a little bit. Cool, Christine? I guess we're thinking Halloween because I'll give another horror example. Um, so one of our partners right now is Warner Brothers and they did the Conjuring 2 360 experience. So I'll actually just walk through kind of two different things. So first the case study of what did that look like? How did that render? And then break away from that and give some stats on, on how that actually looks within ads. Um, so first, just for Conjuring 2, the way that this would work is within our network of publishers, uh, publishers would integrate uh, the ad so that way it's uh, usually opt-in, so something like a check out more VR content or this is sponsored by Warner Brothers um, or something that's like a uh, you want to get to the next level or check out more content, unlock uh, this by watching a VR ad, so something that's a value exchange. So that would be the first step, and then the user's in, and it's in that 360 super creepy experience, and of course at the end they have the decision of, hey, do I want to see the full experience, or do I want to uh, get the home entertainment release, or do I want to go into the theater? They have all those options. Um, so that's kind of the end-to-end -end flow of like, what does a VR ad look like today? Um, in terms of the actual stats, um, we're really excited about the numbers that we're seeing. So this isn't Warner Brothers, this is just like network wide. Um, so what we're seeing for video right now, the completion rates that we're seeing for end to end, 15 to 30 second, 360 video is like 80%. And anyone who's been in ads knows that like on digital and mobile, like that's crazy. Like it's usually 20 to 30% or lower. Uh, and then folks that get to that landing page, that's like, okay, yes, I want to see the whole thing. This is awesome. This is super scary. Um, that interaction is like 30 to 40%, which is also crazy because on mobile, as most people People know it's under 1%. So, uh, so far from a case study standpoint, like we're really excited about the numbers and we know that they're going to taper off eventually. Um, but right now it's hot, it's new. Users want to see content, they want to see these trailers, and, and they're definitely showing it in the numbers. I was looking at uh, literally apples to apples. Uh, a company did a kind of a test and they ran the same content in a traditional two dimensional video and then the exact same content, exact same copy in 360. And it was, it was like 100% better in terms of engagements, impressions, right. and click throughs, and then actual completion rates. It was, it was insane. So the yeah. engagement period, you know, on, on, on Facebook, that's it's a pretty, pretty big gorilla. And uh, totally. yeah, those types of numbers are pretty impressive. Um, Jennifer, what about you? Can you walk us through a case study from Gravity Jack and, and, and kind of how you go through that, uh, through that pipeline? Yeah, definitely. So Thanks. we, we uh, a couple come to mind. Again, we love asking our clients, what's your problem? So that we can try to find the solution for them because sometimes they don't know. They just come at you with a load of problems and, and they're thinking, do it. Um, so a lot of ours too are integrating VR. So in, in the entertainment industry and gaming, I, VR is just a no brainer, right? It's, 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 I don't want to say an easy sell, but it's, it's very, very relevant. So integrating VR into a lot of more real world use cases, for lack of a better word, is trickier. Um, a couple that we've done that uh, pop out that are, can be expanded exponentially is just transporting people. Being able to, I mean, it's immersive. So you want to know what it feels like to be somewhere or to see something, whatever that environment is. If it's an institution, if it's a location, think universities. You're transporting the user there in a really immersive way. Um, 
a fun, quirky one that comes to mind is the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. It's an app we did. Uh, we've done a couple editions for them. And one of their problems was people always want to ask to drive this Wienermobile, and you can't <laughs> drive in it. So we're like, we might have a solution for that. <laughs> and so you can actually experience what it's like. And we, we did that with 360 video. And we have um, different options. I call it Cyclops view. So when you don't have a headset, you can use the Cyclops view where you're holding up your device and you're still getting the full 360 experience. And then you can toggle over to, to get the, the headset. Uh, so that's a fun one. Another is being able to see, um, we did some work with the uh, Defense Forensics Department, being able to see their labs. So they have deployed labs all over the world. And this allowed people to know what it was like in these labs that are you know, collecting and, and processing forensics data in, a, in the say, a space the size of a shipping container. So it really is, it transports people. This is what's happening and this is what it feels like because you're putting them in VR. Sure. Um, Donnie, what, what about you? Can you walk us through a case study and, and kind of maybe what the goals were you know, yeah. on, on that campaign? So over the years, we've done a lot of work in the automotive space for a variety of different auto brands. And also within our research and insights team, we've done a lot of deep dive um, analysis of the landscape and where the auto industry is headed. I will tell you the dealership experience is not going to be the same years from now as it is today because most people hate it. Right? People just dread, go, many people dread going to buy a car. It's a nerve-wracking experience. They don't know what to expect. They think they're going to be had, all kinds of things. Right? And so we've been creating pretty interesting prototypes um, around a, a VR car customizer. You have a car in an environment. We already have this working. You can, f and we're using the HTC Vive, and you're, you're physically walking around the room. So when you have the model of the car drop in, you can walk around the car. You could actually walk under it and like bend down and look underneath it and you really feel like you're there. You can just use the hand controllers and you could change the colors of the panels, you could change the wheels, and you can even share it out to your phone so that you would end up getting like a 360 image of it with your car at different angles in the environment, you could spin it. So we're kind of doing a little bit of future casting with this and we think the car customizer is an interesting place to play. I think it sounds like a lot of fun. I want to customize a car. Um, yeah, uh, speaking of that kind of like creative process and something that all of us have, and I even think that maybe creation tools in VR are, people are maybe underestimating the average person's kind of appetite for creation, right? So when we're talking about that creative process and that kind of creative desire, how do you translate a brand's idea into something that works and functions in this medium, right? So if you guys could get really specific and talk about um, like hardware, if you could talk about constraints like time and cost, that would be super helpful, I think. Clay, what about you and, and that creative process? Time and cost, um, yeah. I can't really speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd say for us in the creative process, um, we approach things um, working with our director, um, defining the story, and sort of like building out, you know, what that story, what that message is. And I think that that's very similar with um, traditional media. But we, along, once we've got the, the story decided, then we kind of work with our head of VR to um, define, you know, camera angles, what's going to tell the story the best, what's going to um, direct the user's attention. Um, specific example would be um, Adidas, where we wanted the person to be engaged enough not to just look at the shoe in front of them. So um, we came up with a story where it was kind of like a monkey in the middle scenario and you had to kind of follow this person. So you'd, get a, you'd hear a basketball bouncing over here, you'd feel the haptic response on your right side. It would cause you to look um, and, and see that person and then they'd run and they'd do a jump shot <laughs> over on your left. So you'd give the user enough time to register, you'd use 3D sound. Um, but really, I think the biggest thing, and this is like we say to our clients over and over, is you really got to be in the headset. You really have to try it. Um, we just did a collaboration with a VFX supervisor uh, from Titanic, and he's, he's a master. He's been doing this for years and years. Um, VR, you know, he's dived into that, but he, he's like, you got to look at it. You got to experience it. Like if you're creating motion graphics coming at you, um, you don't know where that's going to register inside the headset. So I think the more you're actually in the situation looking at it, the better. Um, something that's huge for us is Unreal Engine lets you build stuff inside the headset. You get a sense of scale. 
um, I think that that's going to change the way a lot of uh, content's being produced. Thank you. Vince, how about the creative process? How do you guys kind of funnel that through and, and help uh, solve those needs? Yeah, so I, I think there's, a, there's an inverse relationship between interactivity and distribution um, where, you know, if a brand, every, like so many brand meetings that we're in, a brand will, you know, say, have you seen the Magic Leap website? Like, we want the whale jumping in the gym. And you're like, that's not real. It's not real. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have this, this kind of inverse relationship where, you know, if they want to do a really cool room scale um, experience, the audience, the end audience that's going to be able to consume that content is much smaller, you know, naturally just by the hardware limitations at this point. And so conversely, on the 360 video side, um, you know, Facebook and YouTube and, um, you know, some of the aggregators have much bigger audiences. Um, so it, it kind of comes down to, to the brand and their goals. We generally push brands to focus on mobile um, for three reasons. One, there's more, there's a lot more users right now. Um, and then there's a wider demographic of those users. So, you know, some of them, instead of just being 18 to 34 male gamers, they're female head of household decision makers that got a cardboard, you know, with, the, with their uh, New York Times subscription. Um, and then the third reason is that mobile VR content is more casual in nature and generally more conducive uh, to advertising. And so kind of that mix of reasons is generally why we're kind of pushing brands that direction for now, although the, you know, the premium stuff is really cool. I just, I'm not, I don't think we're there yet. Cool. Christine, how about, how about you in the, in the creative process? And when we're even talking about sort of different tiers of hardware, right? Um, Vince mentioned something about, you know, kind of gaze activated mm -hmm. um, interactivity. And then we're also talking about like in the future and, you know, now, but eye tracking and those types yeah. of, those types of things. How do those kind of maybe tie into those tiers of hardware and how totally. do you work through that creative process mm -hmm. from the ad platform side? Yeah. So I'll kind of answer the, the, the original question, yeah. not as us being a content creator, sure. but uh, working with really amazing content creators and giving some examples there. Um, so Fox Sports recently did the whole live streaming of college football, which is super, super cool. Um, and we did a campaign with them where we actually promoted, like, here's you know content on, like, this is what it's going to look like in headset, and then download this. And on that day, you know, on Saturday at this time, check out this content, live stream that now. So uh, the kind of purpose of me talking about this isn't how creative is this process right now, but what is the potential of this in the future? And there's already been rumoring, so this is more of me saying from like editorial versus actually knowing, um, but I've heard them say from press or from actually this conference that uh, they're gonna do even more, right? Things where they're integrating with social and you're able to actually get uh, a room together, right? Or, or get, uh, what do you call that? The Sure, yeah. yeah the little Facebook's thing, going in right? pretty hardcore yeah. on the rooms and the parties. Exactly. Yeah, we'll all be hanging out on Facebook <laughs> eventually. Exactly, <laughs> but the potential of that where, like, instead of paying $200 to fly somewhere and watch an actual game, like, to do that with your friends that live in New York and San Francisco and actually be able to do that together. So I think it's just, it's an interesting time right now where creativity is kind of at its beginning. Um, and I think with all the social and, and ideally with more distribution, that's going to become a lot more real. Um, and then to go back to your second question, yeah, just the, about yeah, kind the, of the gaze activated versus eye tracking and kind of where we are right now and where do you think it's, it's, it's headed? Yeah, so that's also an area of just huge potential, right? Mm -hmm. Like in terms of eye tracking and heat mapping, like I think it's definitely coming. Um, I think right now though, marketers first want to know the basics, right? Like what is it that are IAB standards? What is it that every marketer is used to having their metrics based on, which is view completion, action, right? And, and being able to track that whole funnel. Um, I think with gaze control uh, and with eye tracking, there's more that's coming, but frankly, there aren't standards yet. Um, we're excited about it. We're testing around with that, but I think it's at least another year until there's an actual standard of like looking at this apple in the room, then you could charge an advertiser this thing, right? I, right. We're just not there there yet, but um, sure. it's definitely coming. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Jennifer, um, back to the kind of the creative process and how you like really tangibly like talked a brand's idea into life and how you, you made something real out of, out of a concept. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, the thing that I've learned, or all of us at GJ have learned over the years and especially lately is it's, our clients have a certain level of ignorance and I don't mean that in any negative way at all. They just don't know what they don't know. 
hence the whale. You know, yeah, oh, I'd love to have the whale pop out. And you're like, so would I. Yeah. It's not real. <laughs> and, and then you kind of give them a few more examples of, hey, this is, this is what's out there. You may have seen it that's not real. And that's OK. It's just more of an educating them and then setting their expectations of what is possible. Um, and then you can flow through and give, again, giving them options. So with you know creative process of, or the particular angle, say it's a trade show event, love, love, love conferences, trade shows, um, you know, product releases for VR because it's really controlled. You know, again, back to the standards, there are no standards. There's no expectations by users yet. So we as developers or, um, you know, VR ad and marketing trying to get into the minds of the users is a tricky spot because what we think, ah, this is it. This is what they're going to do. They're going to love this. And then the thing they like is, is just 180 degrees the opposite direction <laughs> sometimes. So, um, you know, setting realistic expectations in the beginning of the actual technologies themselves, mm -hmm. then giving them options. So here's what a, what a VR experience looks like in, again, the Cyclops view. So nobody has a headset, but you can still experience it. This is how. Then you can toggle switch to do, um, you know, putting your device into a headset. Why is this valuable? You can brand those cardboard headsets or whatever brand, you know, whatever, there's so many out there now, whatever you want to do. So having that as an option to brand that and give to your consumers. The tertiary one is maybe it is on site and you're able to do Vive and you're able to have a more immersive and get under the car and experience it. And there's different levels in which you can do that. So that really intense, super immersive experience on site controlled, the user can't really take away and they can't take it with them. A cardboard headset, they can. They can use it anywhere they want. And again, you give them the option of, we still have them using VR when they don't have access to any sort of wearable. So. Right. Yeah. Tony, how do you guys take, it, take an idea and turn it into something tangible, the VR, AR, 360, whatever it is? Well, there's a pretty extensive process. I could just tell you to speak to maybe a different phase of it than what's been mentioned, is we have this process called our SVP process, which is strategic vision and planning. And it starts with this immersion workshop that we do where we have people coming, stakeholders from the brand, that come and spend anywhere from one to two days with us. And it's a very customized workshop um, with activities that go all around our large conference room. And by the end of it, we really looked into their soul, right? We get down to the DNA level of what they're trying to achieve and why. It goes back to the why again, like why are we talking VR? And oftentimes we try to not have the conversation be there. What are you trying to achieve? So there's this process that we need to go through based on what their goals are. Is the goal to reach a great number of people, in which case you are, you're back in Google Cardboard, right? Because you, you, need, you need mass access. Um, is your goal for it to be a PR stunt? And by the way, we need to have a broader lens than that because anything that we might think of within the VR space is still, in our view, part of a broader customer experience journey. What are they doing as it relates to the brand before they even started that VR experience and what are they doing after? And are those things related or are they not? Because, you know, customers expect a seamless experience across all brand touch points. And so we make sure that as part of the creative process that we, look, we have a broader view of it and then we narrow down and then there's a creative process that unfolds. Right on. Um, so when we're kind of talking about distribution, we're talking about market size, right? We're talking about quality and how the quality is inverse relationship to the market size. And so you have all these kind of different tiers, you know, we have the most accessible tier, something that utilizes your smartphone. So the Gear VR is kind of the best out of that right now. Uh, Google Daydream just got released. And then, you know, Google Cardboard, you can, you know, fit your iOS right in there and see some content, right? So and then we have the middle, the PlayStation VR that just came out. And then we have the big boys like HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, which both require really beefy PCs. So we have different tiers of hardware. We have a very fragmented distribution ecosystem. So how do you navigate that? What's your take on the current climate of that distribution ecosystem? And then maybe give us an example of why you chose one form of distribution or hardware, whatever it is, like walk us through that and like why did you choose that specifically? That would be really super helpful. Cool. Yeah, so for us, it's definitely a question of reach. Um, our clients, both Adidas and Ford, two recent projects we did, um, they wanted eyeballs, they wanted reach. So the obvious choice is, you know, Facebook um, and YouTube. And I, I think that that's just kind of a no brainer. Um, and as you mentioned, Gear VR is like kind of that middle ground. Um, with Ford, we actually um, built Ford VR, which was a custom platform mobile app for them. 
Um, we did that because they wanted to release content um, in their own platform, and uh, it, it just gave us the reach that we needed. Um, we built a Gear VR version for that as well, um, but it's, it's definitely uh, Facebook, YouTube, and, and mobile right now. Um, I think, you know, it could be interesting to see what Hulu does in the future. Um, that could uh, actually arrive, rival the, the two. Yeah, I think so too. I'm in, very interested as well in what Hulu is, is doing in the space for sure. Vince, what about you? And we're talking about distribution, we're talking about hardware and that kind of really nascent bubblings of, of some type of structure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a multi pronged approach. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we're very focused on mobile at the moment. Um, but from a, from a distribution perspective, there's opportunities to kind of bridge the gap um, between what's currently available now from a hardware perspective versus you know, where we're going later and how do we bring some of those eyeballs that, are, you know, that maybe don't have a hardware platform today um, or you know, out, anything outside of their mobile device, um, but to a VR experience. And so uh, an effective way that we've found to do that is um, outside of VR entirely, just in regular mobile. So the example that I generally give people here is that you know, nobody's playing Pokemon Go in a HoloLens, right? They're playing it on a mobile phone because that's where kind of the state of the industry is. And so um, what we're doing, you know, we can do 360 video ads in web and mobile where you can imagine that as, you know, waving your phone across your face and seeing different sides of a 360 video. Um, but today that has access to all the reach and scale and sophisticated targeting um, that advertisers are used to. And then through that, you actually see publishers acting as advertisers as a means to drive discovery of their content as well. And so that's kind of something we've seen as an effective mechanism where, um, like take, um, take a company like New York Times, for example, where they have a 360 app where they're making 360 content on a weekly cadence, sometimes a monthly cadence, um, and they have their own VR cardboard app, right? And they're trying to draw downloads to that app well, kind of their longer term business goal, right, is to drive subscriptions to the New York Times. So if you think about, you know, a model like this 360 advertising in web and mobile, it's they're advertising their content itself. So say Man on Spire or any 360 video content, and then they're doing it with a download link to the store to download their app. So they're drawing more downloads to their app and they can target that against competitive subscribers or whoever they're trying to reach. And that could be true for any publisher, but that's just kind of one successful method that we've seen in terms of kind of creating a multi-pronged approach just to get more people into the environment and finding the content. Cool. Christine, what's your take on, on distribution? Yeah, so I completely agree that the market right now is super fragmented. I'd love to do kind of a like lay of the land of where are the numbers. So I'm sure most people have like looked at articles and all that, but here's where it is, right? So mobile VR today, it's cardboard. Google has reported somewhere between one to three million unique users out there. Gear VR, right, Samsung headset, Oculus ecosystem, that's about one to two million unique users as well. And then with Daydream coming out, I think in the next year we're gonna see numbers larger than that. So that's mobile VR today. Then you are looking at you know the PC versions. So right now with Vive and Oculus combined, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands right now combined. And then with Sony coming out, they've said about a million, it's probably gonna be you know somewhere below that until the end of the year, hopefully that next year. And then we go to China, right? And then in China, you've got like maybe 30 different kind of are saying they're the leading headsets and it's a mix of the Deepungs and the Baofangs and the Picos and there's so many and they all have their own app stores and their own ecosystems. Um, but they're also getting distribution. So combined, you know, there's millions of those headsets out there. So today, if you count that up, like that's 10 million users, um, which is actually a pretty addressable market. So anyway, that's fragmentation today. Um, as a platform for us to actually analyze that, we want to go where the users are going, right? And where the, the actual platforms are pushing and where the content is actually going. Um, so we've also chosen today, our focus is on mobile VR. We are building for some of the premium HMDs. Um, but we also went through a similar transition where we realized, okay, headsets are amazing. We're really excited about in-headset, but there's so much that's happening with 360 because of Facebook and YouTube and 
these cameras, right? It's just super easy. Um, so we also have recently built out a way for users to toggle between uh, the dual screen stereoscopic versus that monoscopic like magic window. And you could check it out. You could go to uh, the Google Play Store and download uh, Jurassic VR. Uh, on that actual app, when you are in that mono screen in that game, then you'll see the mono screen ads. And if you're in the dual screen, then you'll see the dual screen ads. So we're, we're just kind of adjusting to the industry and, and following based on that. Sweet. Jennifer, what about you in distribution? So with the distribution with a lot of our clients, um, again, I hate to go back to the ignorance, but they don't necessarily know. And it's not field of dreams. It's not if you build it, they will come, <laughs> right? They're just thinking, oh, we're going to do this awesome thing and everybody's going to know about it and then it's, it's going to be a big hit. But the users don't know either. So if the users don't know the content is out there, they don't have any clue to even look for it if they don't have any reason to search for that content that's out there. So how that ties into distribution is with kind of what we're going, I think we're all on the same page on the multi-pronged approach because it depends on the audience. And you need to appeal to all of the audiences. You don't want to just do Samsung Gear VR because then you lost half the iOS market. And you, you know, you've got the Google Cardboard, which is great, but then you want to include more immersion, more, more interaction. So having those, um, experiences, again, I'm, I'm with everybody here that mobile is definitely where it's at, but having that beefed up Vive or Oculus version, if it's, if it's within the brand's um, goals and, and, and intentions and, you know, reaching that, so. Cool. Um, and then, and Donnie, I think that you might have some interesting input on the distribution issue, just kind of doing what, you know, going to the car example and choosing the HTC Vive. Can you kind of unpack room scale, kind of unpack the HTC Vive? Why did you go with that and, and, and kind of focus on that and how it's really part of that like buying process? Sure. Yeah. And a lot of it is, has been covered, but as it relates to that specifically, right today, you only have so many consumers. It's not like this is ready to roll out like in a massive way to the public, but you could imagine this kind of thing in an auto show setting. And then you can export it and save it and, you know, carry it away as a 360 kind of video experience that you could use on your mobile device. So it ends up from a distribution standpoint, you can get pretty good reach from it and create a great immersive experience. You can kind of have it all. I will tell you though, that from a fragmentation standpoint and the fact that there are so many formats and so many separate app stores, this, this is not gonna last forever. This cannot. <laughs> if you just think back, I mean, you could go to any, pick a technology, take, take even something like, you know, DVD, and there was like HD DVD and Blu-ray, and you can look at audio formats and the different audio formats there were. Anyone remember like mini disc and things oh, like geez. that? I mean, there are, you could take, take any, I mean, you could pick it. There were multiple formats, and then they get narrowed down. This is going to happen. You can't have this many formats and this many app stores and this much gear. And so it's going to be interesting to see what bears out because ultimately people want reach. They want to reach, uh, they want to get to a maximum um, target audience um, in large numbers. And so we're going to see how this plays out over the coming years. But right now it's like the gold rush, right? Everyone's sort of dipping their toe in. So we just, we need to see what happens with this fragmentation point over the next few years. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's frustrating at, at some points, but then it's also like, wait a second, this is just, this is just kind of the beginnings, right? And, it. and this That's is, right. it. it's growing pains, right? Um, so let's talk about when you have made the content, you've gone through the distribution process, you've put it out there, what do you look at as success metrics? What kind of numbers are you guys looking at to kind of tell if your campaign or whatever the project was, if it was a success or not? Um, Clay, what, do you, how, what kind of things do you guys look at over at Tool? I think we look at, we do a lot of experiential VR, so I think, you know, that's a little bit different to gauge than, say, some mobile experience. Um, for us, it's like if the word gets out um, on Adidas, got really good press releases, the client was super, super stoked, and, uh, you know, the fact that they wanted to bring it to Europe and China, that, that also is a, a measurement of success mm -hmm. for us. So, um, you know, being at the events is definitely a big thing for us so we can gauge it. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely client satisfaction. Cool. What about success metrics for you, Vince? So, I mean, my background is in analytics and originally what fascinated me about VR is that you finally have the potential or the capability to measure the entire content experience. Right, and so there's interesting learnings that can be distilled from that. Um, and right now, it's it's very simple metrics around, you know, gaze and time and 
for instance, like, you know, if I'm in an environment, how long did I look at something? Um, did I engage with it? Um, and then, and, and you can do a lot of just kind of simple time and impression tracking, location tracking uh, through that. And the plan is to kind of, you know, continue working with DMPs and be able to tie all that data, you know, back and forth so you can go from online to offline to VR and back and forth. Um, and then from a success standpoint right now, like kind of following in the Lionsgate example, um, so that, that Blair Witch ad experience plays as a pre-roll when you open uh, the application and then after it plays you have the ability um, to replay it uh, or jump into an experience and so um, one thing that we found was really cool with that experience is that 57 percent of users who came across the ad voluntarily chose to replay it. Oh. Um, so we thought that that was kind of a, a cool metric <laughs> but I mean we're you know I'd, I publish stuff in Ad Exchanger about like how to define the metrics of VR, and it's something that we're working towards. But it's very early on in terms of like if you can imagine the ultimate and being able to measure, you know, sentiment and engagement based on movement or biometric data or all of these kind of things that are starting to emerge, and then you know the ethical questions behind a lot of that, obviously, which you know everybody's going to have their own opinion on, um, and then. Other use cases uh, like product testing, right? You know, so if you put, if you A/B test different versions of products in ad experiences, did people gravitate towards the red version or the black version, or did they intuitively understand this feature better than that feature? And so, you know, those are some of the things that we're thinking about longer term. But right now, it's very simple, like impression. They're looking here. Okay, cool, kind of stuff. Right on. Totally. And, and from just the general, you know, what is success in VR, that just depends on what are the goals of whoever is creating that content or what are the goals of the platform. So I'll try to answer this as like, what is success for the industry, um, for content creators and for ourselves? And the first is obviously quality experiences, right? Something that's sticky, something that's bringing users back, something that's being refreshed constantly. Um, so that's the first thing. Second is scale, right? Like even though I, I was just like, yes, 10 million users, but really like that's still in the very beginning, like there needs to be more scale. And fortunately we're in a good kind of perfect storm of the platforms pushing for this, the content's being created, the users are getting interested, but we need more scale. Uh, and then the third is something that I don't hear very much at these conferences, which is the ROI. Um, I know it's early, a lot of the focus is on value and, and creating these cool experiences, um, but at the end of the day, it, it's gotta be sustainable. Um, right now, it's like half the dollars that are putting into it are, are venture dollars or R&D budgets from larger companies, right? But at some point, it needs to actually be the business model. Um, so I do think that figuring out ROI, whether it's with in-app purchases or more sponsorship models, or more advertising or a combination of all those different things, uh, there just needs to be, again, a combo of those three things. So quality, scale, and ROI. Jennifer, what about you? How, well, uh, how, like maybe give us a, a use case of, of, of what things you were looking at and numbers that you're looking at to, to measure success. Well, I love the dwell time kind of talks about where they're, they're looking around, where they're navigating, what they're spending time on, be it the menu selections. Um, you know, how many times, so if it's a touring experience, for example, you're using look navigation, I look at this door and then it's going to take me to the next center and I can explore there and it takes me to another. So how many of those did you go through? How long were you in the experience? Again, the reality is most VR is mobile and mobile analytics now are beautiful. So, um, I, you know, I had a client talking to him and they said something about analytics that I hadn't mentioned and I started laughing and I was like, I'm sorry. I mean, I understand there's other companies out there that don't do analytics. I go, well, that's like going to Antarctica without snow boot stuff. <laughs> like, you just you plug them into your experiences so you can track all that from yeah. a number of different touch points. So then success is, is going back through those really great analytics and understanding that as it pertains to your original goal or your future goal, where you're wanting to go with that. Um, one more recent thing that I've really tried to introduce or encourage with my clients is to take the funding, which it was funny when you said the R&D, because <laughs> like, this stuff should be coming out of the marketing budget, but mm -hmm. it's not. The, the marketing budget mm -hmm. of these larger companies are just so skittish and so old school that you've got the, the R&D or you've got the you know uh, innovation group and you're, they're pulling money from, it's like this hodgepodge of budget because some people want to see it done yeah. and it needs to be these marketing groups that are going, this is marketing. 
it, it's, not, like, it's not even a question anymore. Yeah, how are you navigating that? Like, you know what I mean? What department is the money coming out of? It is. Right? It like, is, how, do, how do you navigate th those waters? I Put me on the phone. Let's go. <laughs> let's, let's pull them in. Let's get the marketing team. Let's have a conference call. Yeah, okay, yeah. where they are in the country, we okay. can do this. And this last, con I, I had 12 people on the call. And this, <laughs> I had somebody in London, New York. We were all over the map. And I was just like, let's do this. Let's get everybody together so everybody can hear firsthand the value. Because, again, it goes back to they don't know what they don't know mm -hmm. and that's where it's our job to help teach them and 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 let them know what they can do it's yeah. also pretty reminiscent of like early mobile days I, I remember going out to customers like even like Amazon I was like where's your mobile website <laughs> they didn't have yeah. it what do you right? mean? Yeah. it works so great you it's just the pinch same and thing, zoom right? and you're like, no, but the but difference this time is that everyone's actually really excited about it yeah. like there's like these like beat teams that exist in every large company where somebody from every group is like I want to be in VR so right. there's a different level of excitement which is cool well, that creates like a fight because <laughs> then it's like every group fighting against each other to own VR for that company, <laughs> yep. right? And it's like, everybody's like, no, we own VR, no, we own VR, no, we're getting the budget for this, no, we're getting the budget for this, so. Totally. Yeah. And it's like kind of yeah. a land grab at this point, because it's like a shiny object that everybody wants to be a part of. And it goes, we want it, we want it, but they don't know what they want. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, even in. just as it gets to this question, even from a marketing standpoint, it's like, what is the goal? I mean, you're right, ROI is really tricky right now. Um, how do you measure it? But if you, if you think there might be a PR angle, right? You do something that's big and stunty and immersive, it's only gonna reach so many people from the, and the experience itself. But if it's written about and talked about, you can get some lift. The other thing is you wanna reach as many people as possible with the experience itself, which means you're probably hitting mobile devices. That's a very different kind of goal and you're not measuring success in the same way, depending on um, how you're approaching it. But you know, in both cases, it's VR technically. But you know, what again? What are you trying to achieve, and what's the best path to create the best customer experience? And what are the long-term goals of the brand? Why are you doing this to begin with? Um, I will tell you though, it, slightly going back to your even fragmentation point and the fact that there's so much, so many different types of content being created on different platforms. That competition's really good, because things are going to get better very fast. Um, and everyone is trying to have the best product and everyone's trying to have the best content. And so I think we're gonna see a faster climb in this space than we've seen historically in other, in other spaces, whether in technology or otherwise. Yeah, I think just as the, the technology itself is exponential, I think the quality itself uh, might follow a similar Hopefully. similar trend. Yeah, we hope right? so. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, so I want to kind of finish up and then give give one specific example of a brand, uh, a specific activation, specific specific thing that is not yours. <laughs> something that you really dug and something that kind of stood out to you. Something that <coughs> it's not it's not one that you did. <laughs> cool. Um, for me, it was uh, Google's film, Pearl. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Um, that, I mean, I viewed that with our directors and like literally people were coming out of the headset crying. Um, I think it's like a great example of storytelling and, and immersion. Um, there's definitely this one specific scene that's a favorite of mine. You, you're in a car, there's a sunroof. Um, I saw this in Vive. You stand up and there's like a swarm of like fireflies flying towards you. <laughs> Like great soundtrack, um, I think it's beautiful, and I'm I'm so happy to see people making that kind of content. Nice, Vince. Um, I would say the uh, it's like kind of an oldie but a goldie now. The uh, the Tom's shoes giving trip. Um, did anybody see that? Yeah, that was it was good. Uh, I mean, good really, story. really powerful. If you think about a brand telling their story and how you know they've created Tom's has created such a successful brand over the past 10 or 15 years, whatever it's been, but it's like every single consumer doesn't see the other side of that. They don't see where that other pair of shoes goes. And so for Tom's to be able to show people that, I mean, it's like, you know, you see people in the Tom stores crying after they finish it, but it's just such a nice, you know, idea for a branded content piece where it's like you're really connecting and engaging audiences with your brand. And so I'd have to say, I and mean, I think that was the within guys, I think it's, I think so, yeah. yeah. Christine? Okay, no, you said just one, but yeah. I'm going to say two. Go for it. <laughs> and one that's just something I enjoy and one that I'm excited about for the industry. So the one that I enjoy, has anyone seen Penrose's Alumet? Yeah. Yes. 
It's so good. Beautiful. Yeah, no, I totally cried and it was super awkward because I was in the middle of a meeting and my CEO and I both took off our headsets and we were both crying looking at each other. <laughs> it was so embarrassed, but it was great. So anyway, check it out. Great, great piece. Check it out. It's a tearjerker. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, which one was it? Alumet. Okay. Alumet. Yeah, it's like, I think it's the name for that is French for a matchbox. Yeah, it's like little matchbox girl. Yeah, like a cute so cute. Take on it. Yeah. If you're really close to your mom, you'll love it. Or if you have a daughter, <laughs> it's it's perfect. Second thing, just got announced today. So MBA and NextVR are doing uh, an actual live streaming of uh, of games. So that's huge. This is actually something that hits the mass uh, the mass audience actually. So I'm excited to see where that could go. Um, so I'll keep that one short. <laughs> so for me, I kind of two separate things, but one was, um, I love the idea of foundations. And I go back and get gaming entertainment's a no brainer, but these real world experiences and being able to transport people. The, the point of VR is immersive. It's supposed to take you away from whatever's here, right? Um, and so being able to see where the shoes go, the Bill Gates did, Foundation did a, a VR video that was all about um, going to Africa and AIDS and same thing, where this, po this person, you're in an office and they're actually told they have HIV. Same thing, tears coming Excellent. down and it's just powerful. So I can watch a video, but when you put a headset on, you're there. I don't know, it's just so different. So that was a powerful one. Right on. And then some of the gaming ones. One, one just <laughs> like, but Tilt that uses um, planetary exploration and, and, and being able to you're in space. You're not just looking at it in a textbook. or So that immersion from an education standpoint, too. I always love that. Right on. Donnie, what about you? What's, what's a piece of content that really stands out that you didn't do? Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you two as well. One has nothing to do with content. It's more about distribution. Um, have you guys seen the happy goggles at McDonald's? Which yeah, is yeah. really kind of funny how you take a Happy Meal <laughs> box and then it kind of, you know, it's perforated and you peel it open and you fold it and it basically turns itself into a, kind of the equivalent of like Google Cardboard. You could put your phone in it and it's branded McDonald's and people take it home. From a distribution standpoint, yeah. it's kind of nice because, you know, it's an easy way to get it in the hands of more people. The other thing is actually something that I saw when I was at Cannes this year in Cannes Lions um, and it, it won an award and it was... I want to say it was called um, either Field Trip to Mars or Tour Bus to Mars. Have you guys seen this? Mm -mm. They basically took a school bus and they told all the kids um, that they were going to be going on a field trip. I don't think the kids knew where. But all of the screen, all of the windows on the bus at some point sort of black out. And then it was one giant virtual reality experience where you felt like the bus is driving through Mars. And as you're driving, I mean, you're seeing the landscape changing. And I remember when I saw that um, as it was winning an award, I was pretty impressed with it. I thought it was very creative and a great use. It was of, like the, uh, the magic school, school bus. bus. Yeah. The magic school bus. It's really great. Very clever. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all wanted to get on the magic with that crazy kid, teacher. Right? Yeah. yeah, they had yeah. so much fun. Um, so we're going to go down the line. Everyone's going to uh, reintroduce themselves, remind us who they are. How do we find out more? Where do we find you? My name is Malia Probst, director of brand development for VR Scout. You can find me on Twitter at the Malia, and I have a couple of podcasts in the space. One is called the Real Virtual Show, and the other one is called the VR Scout Report. So you can play. Where do we find you from Tool? Clay Weisar, creative director. Uh, clay at toolofna.com and my Twitter is Clayco with a K. Vince Cacace, founder and CEO of Vertebrae. Uh, we're based right here in Santa Monica and um, our website is vertebrae.io. My email address is vince at vertebrae.io and uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Vertebrae Inc. <laughs> uh, Christine Lee with Immersive. Um, you could check us out on immersive.co um, but note that there is no vowels because we're based in Silicon Valley <laughs> so you can find us there you can email me Clee uh, Clee at immersive.co Jennifer Ritchie uh, original founder or one of the original founders of Gravity Jack uh, you can find us at gravityjack.com <laughs> and uh, Jennifer at gravityjack.com such a great name <laughs> really is. Donnie Macauer, president and co-founder of Red Interactive Agency. We're headquartered here in Santa Monica. Um, our URL is an interesting one. We're not red.com or redinteractive.com. We are the hexadecimal code for the color red. So we're actually FF 
0000.com, two Fs and four zeros. Easy. So my, uh, yeah, Easy. I know you would think that wouldn't have stuck over the years, but years we grabbed this years ago and we were amazed how creatives and developers and stuff could not believe that we had the hex code for red as our URL, and so we never got rid of it. Um, and my email address is donny.macauer. You've got my spelling over here. Donny is D-O-N-N-Y. Um, donny.macauer at ff0000.com. <laughs> We call Amazing. it foo for short, even though there's zeros, <laughs> not o's. We just say foo. It's like a mess of people. Foo. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.